So welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. Um, we are excited to talk about the starting line with, with author Robert Krosno. If you have questions for Robert, please post them in the chat and we'll get to them at the end of the program. And um, in case you haven't seen it, here's the book. So uh, Robert is an Associate Dean at the College of Liberal Arts and the Rappaport Sentinel Professor of Sociology at the University of Texas at Austin. He studies the health, social development, and education of children, adolescents, and young adults, and how those connections factor into socioeconomic and immigration-related inequalities in American society. Dr. Krosno has written multiple, has won, sorry, apparently I cannot read today, mm -hmm. multiple university awards for teaching undergraduate coursework on children, families, education, and public policy. So welcome, Robert. We're glad to have you. And would you like to start with telling us a, a little bit about yourself and the book? Well, thank you for having me, Jennifer. Um, and I wish, of course, that we could be there in person. I wanted to start off by saying that I grew up in very near to Fort Worth, so it feels like home. And in that spirit, I should say that I go by Rob, so anybody can call me Rob. And I'd prefer to just talk with you and answer any questions you might have, but I thought a good way to begin would be telling you a little bit about myself and about the book and how those two things go together. And the big theme is evolution of thought. So the first evolution is that there's been a lot of maturation in the way that I think about immigration, away from a more simplistic version of the American dream message I received growing up to a more realistic version that recognizes both the challenges that immigrants face and the strengths that they bring to those challenges. And that reflects growing up in the public schools of North Texas, spending a good chunk of my adulthood in the traditional immigration gateway of California and the new immigrant destination of North Carolina, and then returning to Texas as a social sociologist trained in the analysis of inequality. Second, I shifted over time in the focus of my research on schools from the experience of adolescents and high schools and young adults and colleges to the experience of very, very young children in preschool. And that reflects a lot of things, including some important lessons that we learned from economists that show that doing educational interventions that target early childhood bring greater long-term returns to investment than in interventions aiming for adolescents or, or older kids. My growing awareness that for immigrant children, preschool is not just the gateway to the educational system the way that it is for all American children, but also their introduction to American society. And also the personal fact that I became a parent myself during my research career. And all of a sudden I got really interested in anything that had to do with little children or my ability to parent those little children. And then third, I was trained as a demographer, which is a field that specializes in, in using very advanced statistics. Oh, hi, dog. Very <laughs> advanced statistics. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> to map out broad patterns on the national level. And I truly believe that those broad brushstrokes are important. But over time, I felt more and more that I needed to hear the voices and see people in real time. So I began to complement my national statistical portraits by going into communities and schools and observing people and interviewing them as they went about their daily lives. And so I felt like it was a way of understanding better what I saw on the national level. So all of this led up to the research that I've conducted on the early childhood education of Latino children, especially children from Mexican immigrant families who are growing up in Texas. And the starting line grew out of that research. That book is predicated on the idea that increasing the number of children from low-income families in early childhood education programs is an important way to reduce inequalities among U.S. children as they grow into tomorrow's adults. And that idea is crystallized in the lives of low-income Latino children. And I argue that public, the public pre-K program in Texas offers a valuable tool to understand and why and figure out how to make it work. So I thought that the way to do that would be to focus on what I refer to as connections. And that means delving into the ways that what goes on inside early childhood education classrooms is connected to the larger school and community environment. So questions like how do teachers work with other people in their schools and how are schools and families working together? It also means delving into the ways that all of the different things that go on inside an early childhood education classroom 
connect together into a cohesive whole? So those questions are like, how are classroom activities meant to foster children's socio and emotional development, aligning with those meant to help them develop cognitive and academic skills? And how do efforts to help immigrant children learn English go with efforts to help them learn other academic subjects and skills? And I tried to answer these questions using a system I call watching and talking. So over the course of the year, I and my students worked with 59 teachers in nine schools in one of Texas' largest urban districts, which I call Southwest, but that's a made up name. The watching part involved this, a system of observation in each classroom where you spend a long time going back and forth between observing specific activities and then taking notes on them or recording notes on them and then going at the end and using those notes to rate classrooms on a large number of aspects of classroom quality. The talking part involved interviewing teachers face-to-face -face and in-depth about their teaching goals and their challenges, and then also leading focus groups for parents to talk about what their experiences were. And because of where this took place, and because of the nature of the state Texas program and the populations that it targets, these classrooms were overwhelmingly populated by children from low-income and mostly Mexican immigrant families, and the majority of the teachers were bilingual and Latino. The book is really a description about what I learned by asking those questions and answering them in this way. And I can go into more detail on that as we discuss it, but I just wanted to say two things before I stop talking. The first is that this is really a story about how advancements are matched with setbacks, about how good things and bad things go together, about how successes come with challenges. And it's really in that mixture that we figure out a blueprint for moving the educational system forward. And the second thing is that I started off the book by talking about what I call the mayhem of early childhood classrooms. And anyone who's been in one as a parent, as a teacher or anything else can relate to that. Walking into one of those classrooms can be like sensory overload for an adult. There's so much going on and so many noises and so much happening. But as I say in the book, there's a magic to that mayhem, and we really have to tap into that ma magic to get towards the future. So that's really the key of what we're trying to do. So I'm happy to answer the questions that you have or anything else you want to talk about. So you've kind of started talk uh, touching on this, but I kind of want to um, needle in on this part a little bit more. Your book, book focuses on early education in Texas schools and how it serves Latino and Latina children. Can you ex talk a, a little bit more in depth about why this topic is so important for us to explore and how it affects not only how the kids do through the rest of their school years, but then how that affects the community as well? Yeah, so, um, you know, when you talk about preschool, a lot of people have a tendency to not think of it as quote unquote real school because, you know, they think about kids, you know, using paints and playing and things like that. But over time, we've come to realize how the whole foundation of the educational career is based in early childhood education. And so we know, and we know that more now more than ever, the educational career is really important to how people wind up in terms of the money that they make and the jobs that they get and how productive that they, they are economically. And that in turn is really important to the economy, um, economy. So you start off with something like preschool and you just think it's about little children, but through these like cascade of effects, it's really important to maintaining the economic productivity of the country, you know, of, of society. And that's why Texas is really was a leader in creating early childhood education programs. Because a long time ago, when I was a child, actually, Ross Perot, who died this year, you know, is a very famous Texan, led this task force for the state of Texas to try and figure out how to best boost economic productivity and create a more skilled and more productive workforce. And his big thing was creating an early childhood education. So that was really forecasting something we'd all come to realize, which is what I alluded to earlier. Like if you really wanna make change and create a more educated adult population, you start when kids are really, really early. 
Now you match that with the fact that we have this huge Latino population. It's a very diverse population, but they face a lot of disadvantages growing up. There are higher rates of poverty. You know, there's often language barriers between their families and the schools. There's a lot of anti, anti-immigrant backlash and the fact that immigrant parents often don't, you know, they didn't come up through U.S. schools, so they don't know them as well. And so you put these two things together, the power of early childhood education, of creating a more equal and productive society, the growing Latino population and some challenges they face. And you put those two things together and you, th- and you think, well, really investing in early childhood education in Texas schools for Latino children is a way to go, not just for the Latino children, but for everybody else. And so one of the things I thought was really interesting um, as I was reading through the book was you talk a lot about something you just mentioned. The parents, many of them have not been through U.S. schools, so they don't understand what the cult- what the school system culture, to use that as, as an example, how that works. And you you talked a, a, quite a bit in the book about how teachers would say the parents aren't engaged and they're not participating. And the parents would say, you know, we want them to do, we're helping, we're making sure they do their homework and we're doing these things to where the parents thought they were engaged. And there was this disconnect, right? Because they didn't really understand the school was expecting one thing and the family was expecting something else. And that was not being communicated um, back and forth. Um, and that um, many of the parents would see the teachers as um, the authority figure and they would kind of just go with what they or you know, they were expecting that they would lead them in what they needed to do. And, and I, I find that really interesting. And, and what do you think that there are things, what are the things you think that we need to be focusing on to kind of bridge that communication gap so that we can get kind of everybody on the same page to where we're kind of working forward together to get the students where they need to be? So that's exactly right. I mean, this is not a question of values or anything like that or motivations. It's really just about people not being on the same page because they don't know that they're not on the same page, right? So they don't. um, And so, you know, one thing that happens when you grow up in a country, you know, including the United States, is that you think that the way we do things is the way everybody does things, right? And that's not exactly true. So we tend to think that schools across the world are arranged in the same way that ours are. And sometimes that's true, but sometimes it's not. And one of the things that UT, or not UT, excuse me, um, that US schools are really um, extreme on is this idea that parents should be really involved in the schools and really kind of running the show in schools and really being active managers of their kids' daily education. That's not true in most other countries. Um, It's not really true in many Latin American countries, for example, regardless of the socioeconomic differences. And if you think about it, there's an argument to be made that that's not good, right? To have parents um, that involved in the educational system. So it's not so much, but the problem is, is because you have parents coming in with a very different model about their role in the educational system, And schools aren't really telling them what they expect of them. They're just assuming that they all agree on the same thing. It can lead schools to have somewhat negative opinions about parents and parents to be somewhat confused by what's going on in schools. And so it's, it's not, there's nothing malicious or bad about it. It's just people not being on the same page. So how do you fix that? Well, you know, this is where the idea of, having liaisons between families and schools is a good idea. Many of the schools that I work with have um, parent parent support specialists whose job really is to, to go back and forth between the two. It's often viewed as telling parents what schools want, but of course it's a two way street, right? That 
schools need to know what parents want and what they think too. And if not of something like a parent support specialist, this is why having partnerships between schools and communities is important and having community leadership in schools. It's just about breaking down those barriers. And I recently listened to a, a podcast um, about New, New York City schools called Nice White Parents. Yes. Um, I just heard it's going to be a TV show. So ooh. <laughs> um, and, and one of the things that I kind of got from that and from mm. your book as well is that when we expect parents to be so involved with the schools, um, we don't take an account for work schedules, mm-hmm. right? So what, so a lot of times when I was reading your book, I kept thinking, well, how, how these are low income parents. They're, they've got to be working maybe more than one job. Mm-hmm. How are they? How, how can the school expect that they need to be so involved in the school itself when, right, they're, they're concerned with ma- meeting the basic needs of themselves and their, their families, right? Um, and I think it's kind of an interesting shift in our own thinking that we need, that we need to, to think about, about, um, we don't always consider that maybe those parents aren't at PTA meetings because they literally cannot be at PTA meetings. They're working, you know, the other parent is working and they have to be, be home with, with the kids. And I really, um, I really appreciated that, that, you know, there was some discussion about that mm-hmm. and that it's something that we really need to, um, we need to think about how we how we reach certain people. It's not it's not all one way, right? Um, because it can't be because not everybody has the ability to do um, as much as some others. Um, particularly if you have a family that somebody doesn't work and and they just stay at home, and then you have a family where every adult in the house is is working, you know, 40 plus hours a week just to make sure that their family has the basic needs that they have. Yeah, and you know, there are some, many parents that don't speak English and schools don't, I mean, you know, the good, one good thing about Texas is that, you know, just historically, you know, we our schools tend to be more adept at managing those language barriers that are inherent to having a large immigrant population. But a big part of it is just what I call practical barriers, right? Which is exactly what you said. Like, you know, schools have a limited time frame of operation during the day um, and during the week. And not everybody has the flexibility to deal with that. I mean, and so it's sort of an un fair expectation in, in that sense. Um, it's also true that let's say that those practical barriers were even across different groups. Then there's the question of status and power, right? And that, um, you know, if someone like me who looks like me is a professor at UT, if I go in and start, you know, trying to um, advocate for my child at school or express my opinions about things, it's going to carry weight, right? You know, it has some status, you know, because of the way we perceive people and the biases that we have, it's going to have, you know, it's going to be more, I have something like power to make it happen. Not everybody has that, right? And so you have these practical barriers and these, what I would call power barriers or status barriers. And then there's also this thing, I I won't say it's cultural, but it is this idea about how you view families and schools, right? And people raised in the United States view them as somewhat intertwined in many other countries, if not most other countries. There's this idea of like, I'm in charge of my kids, you know, who they are, their health, their well-being, turning them into good people. And I send them to you for them to learn, you know, academic skills and things like that. You do your job. I'll do my job. We're parallel. And this kid will turn out great. It's a very sensible way of doing things, actually. It's not really how we do it. 
So you have the practical barrier and the power barrier, and then this other kind of barrier. And so what that means is that if you are going to have the expectation that parents are going to be that involved in the school and the program, that's fine. But you also then have to make some adjustments to figure out how you're going to deal with these barriers, which fall unequal. And, you know, you have to put some thought into that as opposed to just saying we expect you to be here between this time and this time and, you know, do this, this and that. And I have to say, you know, like I, you know, I personally, I've raised two children. They're in high school now. And over the years, um, I've become more exasperated by the expectations of a lot of the things that I'm going to be doing. Um, and not just from schools, but from other parents, right? You know, and, and the community at large. And I think, well, if I'm exasperated or I feel like there's, the expectations are too much for me. Imagine, you know, I can leave work at three to go do something. So um, imagine what that, and, you know, I do have a partner who can help with that. Um, so imagine what it would be like, you know, we're not all on the same playing field here. Excuse me. Um, you mentioned a conversation that we hear a lot regarding Texas and education. As, go tex as goes Texas, so goes the rest of the country. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about why this is a commonly heard phrase, why you think it's true and what it means in lessons to be learned? I think well, there's two big things going on here. One is that um, Texas is a demographic bellwether, which means that the composition of the state is almost always a couple of decades ahead of where other states eventually get to. And so that's in part because of immigration um, and also internal migration, meaning people moving here from other states. And also just, it has to do with birth rates across different groups. And so what that means, and it's not just immigration from Latin America. I mean, Houston is the most demographically diverse city in the, I think in North America actually, right? And that's because you have, you know, this broad representation um, of Asian immigrants, African immigrants, and Latin American immigrants all at once. And that really is where Texas, where its composition has come from. And it just so happens that the, the country is, is moving in the same direction, but it's always a step behind. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so where we look now is where not every other state, but many other states are eventually going to get to. Um, the second thing is that we have, well, and so because of that, if we face challenges in education, for example, dealing with that diversity or addressing that diversity, and we figure out things to do, best practices, then another state doesn't have to figure that out, right? They can just look back to us and say, well, this is how they handled it, right? And we can implement that. That's important. Now, the second thing is really just about influence. And this is partly because of our size. It's partly because we're Texas, you know, partly for lots of other things. California has a similar role, which is that we just are like the 100 pound gorilla or 200, whatever that, that phrase is, that if we do something, it immediately has influence on other states. And just as an example of that, you know, if a textbook gets adopted in Texas, it's going to get adopted pretty much everywhere. That's just one example, just because our market is so great, it swamps everything else. So you put these two things together, we're demographic bellwether, we have a lot of influence over the rest of the country. And you see that we're like a test case, right? Like if, if things need to be tested out, if there's a policy or a practice, we're a good place to test it. And then it can be proven, We California is the same way, then it can be proven and then other people don't have to explore or investigate. They can just do. It's a, you know, it's a, so people can learn from us. They can learn from our mistakes too, I should say, you know, and that's actually much more probably common than learning from our successes. Um, what do you think that we as a state are getting right for early childhood education? What do you think we need to improve on? And how does or what can commu the community, including organizations like libraries, 
help with this type of education? The biggest thing that we're getting right is simply that we make it a priority, right? That at a state level, we view it as important. And that is a huge, huge achievement historically, you know? And some other things that we do is that we, you know, we tend to view um, early childhood education as like part of this community spirit, right? Like it's this enterprise that brings together the community, schools, families, et cetera. That's great. We also tend to view early childhood education within the state as a mixture of, you know, a being about like, it's not the same as school, right? Like, you know, yes, it's about learning certain things and doing certain things, but it's also just giving children a healthy space to develop. And then the last thing I'd say is that, you know, we really have like what's often called a whole child approach, which means that, you know, we think about all of kids needs, you know, the phrase I always use is it's, um, it's hard for a kid to learn when they don't feel well, right? And so the fact that our early childhood education programs often are linked to health services is really important, right? You have to attend to the whole child. It also means that children might not be able to learn if their families are facing challenges. And that's why there's a lot of the ways that families access services that they need is through schools. Um, so those are all really good things. I mean, there's still a lot of progress to be made. Um, and I think that the biggest thing is that we focus a lot on um, increasing the numbers of kids who are in early childhood education. And now we need to focus more on the quality of the education that they're getting. So we've worked on access, now we need to do this. Um, you already brought this up, but I think that we talk a good game about families and teachers, families and schools working together. But when you actually look at what they're doing together, it's not exactly what we want, right? And so we need to really cap better capture the spirit of that partnership. Um, we tend to, sometimes in practice, we, um, we tend to focus on either the socio-emotional development of kids or the academic skill development of kids, as opposed to how those two things are connected to each other. Um, and that's especially true when we also have the, you know, when we also have the responsibility of helping immigrant children learn how to speak English before they enter the K through 12 system, right? When, when, we, when we are really focusing on language instruction, we often lose sight of some of the other kinds of things that we tip that another kid would be getting in school. And then I think also early childhood education. So um, in Texas, you know, a lot of our early childhood education programs, the state funded ones are part of elementary schools, right? You know, it's just like elementary school starts a year early for kids who are eligible for that. It starts before kindergarten. And that's great. But in practice, um, early childhood education, preschool, whatever you want to call it, pre-K, pre is often really isolated and segregated from the rest of the school. So what you see is that among preschool teachers and early childhood education, they're kind of all working together and figuring out what works and what's not in that setting. And that's great. But what we're missing is more coordination between the early childhood educators and the teachers and educators that they're gonna send their kids to, right? Like there's not as much collaboration between those two things, which is why it's possible for kids to you know, have an early childhood education experience and then have like a drop off after that, um, as they move into ele elementary school, or the opposite, that they have an experience in early childhood education that doesn't really, isn't really geared towards preparing them for what comes next, right? So that isolation really has to, has to stop. And what do you think, what do you think are the, the ways that we can kind of start making those pathways and those connections so that those communications happen. Um, is it just that pre-K is in a separate part of the building or is it that, um, you know, there needs to be set times, <clears throat> excuse me, where teachers, you know, are actually having collaboration time 
together to talk about things. I mean, you know, there, it's a little bit of both, right? It's, it's partly where, the, where these places are physically. Um, but I also think there's just this cultural divide where, you know, they don't view, I mean, early childhood education is different than elementary school, right? And it shouldn't be viewed as the same. But I think that that sometimes artificially means that they're, you know, they're not part of the same team. And so like in many elementary schools, especially in the early grades, there's what we call vertical teams, where it's not just that you're that teachers are working with, you know, the other teachers in their grade. They're also working with the teachers in the grade before and after them so that we're all we're all aligned, like. When a kid goes into my classroom, I have a sense of where they're coming from and what I need to do to prepare them for what's going to be expected in the next level. And those vertical teams, unfortunately, don't often or don't as consistently um, extend into early childhood education. And the more we could do that, I mean, the model's already there. Just the more that we can um, incorporate early childhood educators in that, the better. Now, of course, the big problem is that you know, we're talking about the pre-K, the public pre-K program in Texas, the state-funded one that's really aligned with school districts. Well, as many kids are in that, there's a lot more kids that aren't. And, you know, that either they're not in early childhood education or more likely they are in some form. It's just not aligned with this, um, with the, the school district. Uh, public education system. And so that means that I mean, I don't know exactly what to do about that, right? That's a much harder, um, harder deal with, to deal with. Um, <clears throat> so you kind of, when you were talking about kind of how you stepped through, um, how you got the information for this book, you sort of already started talking about your research process, but um for those who haven't had a chance to read the book yet or don't have much experience with academic research, can you talk about what goes into researching a book like this, how much time you spend researching, mm -hmm. and then translating that into actual written words on the page? Yeah. Um, well, I, I can just, in, I think I can give this picture that um, it took me two years to plan the project, like to design it and get the design of it vetted by other people who, you know, said, yeah, this is the way to go. You want to make sure that you have a lot of affirmation going in so that you know that you can do it right. And in that, those two years of planning, it also took me a long time to raise the money to do this, right. To be able to go into, um, the school district and say, well, I can pay your teachers to participate in this, right? So that they're getting something out of it. I can, you know, have um, people helping me collect the data and all of that stuff. And, um, and so that was two years to plan. It took two years to execute. So we were actually in the school for two academic years, right? Just because if you think about it, just the observation alone, I, I can't remember how many hours it took, but you know, for each one of these classrooms, we did multiple observations and each one of those observations lasted several hours. Um, and then all of the interviews on top of that. So two years to plan, two years to execute. And then we had this mountain of data you know, that could have filled a whole laptop. Um, and then we had to analyze it, right? So it's not just enough to collect the data, then you have to figure out what it's telling you. And so that took two years. So really from start to finish, it took six years to do that. Now, the book itself took a little bit longer, um, you know, after that six year period, just because, um, you know, the nature of my job, you know, I had to write it in fits and spurts. So that gives you a sense of the time frame, And I was really lucky because I did, was able to raise the funds to do this from a foundation and called the Foundation for Child Development. And they allowed me, as I said, to help pay the teachers, um, give them some bonus. It also um, allowed me to hire some help to deal with a lot of these things, including, you know, my Spanish is, you know, functional, but it's not good enough to, um, you know, interview um, a group of parents for three hours in a row. So, um, you know, getting help with that and then also the translation and things like that. 
Um, so it's a lot, it's a big investment. And that's why we have universities to some extent, because, you know, I can have my job teaching, you know, and being an administrator and do this as part of that job, as opposed to thinking about it as something that, um, you know, that's the, that would be the only thing I do. So it does extend the time frame a lot. But universities are subsidizing all of the knowledge that's coming out of these things. And that's an important thing that universities do in our society. Because otherwise, where else would we get this type of knowledge, you know, that, that we need? That, that, and then we can go back and work with schools. And, you know, either the schools can tell us this is what we want to know, right? Like, you know, this is what we care about. This is what we want to know. And or the um, the the researcher says, well, this is what we've learned, right? You know, and this is what we can tell you. Um, and then, you know, ho uh, the hope is, is that that is useful for them. So, um, I mean, I, I knew they took a lot of time, but I was not anticipating mm -hmm. that, that much time. So, um, and I know you've written some other um books that are that are kind of of similar nature mm -hmm. um have they all kind of taken that amount of time yeah i mean the important thing to remember is that some of these overlap right and so um but yeah i mean in general if you're going out to collect data um you know of this nature it takes a long time um you know writing books takes a long time too Right. But that's on top of, you know, the, the bigger part of all of this stuff. And so I, um, I remember I, um, I spent a year in high school um, just following teenagers around and trying to figure out how they live their lives and how their social part of being a teenager was good or bad for the academic part of being a teacher. And um, I remember I did that year, the year that my daughter was born. And then um, I think it was four years, three or four years after that, um, I was able to turn to this project, right? And, um, and there was an overlap, right? So each one of those projects took like five to six years from start to finish, but they overlapped a little bit, right? right. And and the reason I mentioned my daughter is because she's in high school now, right? So it just gives you a sense of, <laughs> like, these are what I view as fairly recent projects. Right. That's the time frame we're talking about. It's funny because, you know, my, a big part of it, um, my that first project I was talking about, about high school and the social lives of teenagers, um, you know, Facebook hadn't been invented yet, right? You know, my, you know, um, all of that stuff was. And so over the course of that project, like the world changed, right? But mm -hmm. that's, you know, sometimes the world changes a lot faster than your ability to study it. That's, that, that's interesting. I mean, I'm always grateful that things like social media didn't exist when I was yes. a, a yes. teenager. I agree. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. um, but you know, thank God, like, just think about this. Like if, if the pandemic had happened, when you and I were in school, I, I mean, what, what would we have done? You know, I mean, like yeah. there would, I mean, there was no internet. I mean, there was no, internet, no, but, you know, there was no zoom. There was no, I mean, I don't there know. Was there was nothing. No. Yeah. So I spent, has spent a lot of the last year complaining about zoom and, you know, things like that and living your life on it. But then you stop back and think like, Oh my God, thank God we had that. Cause otherwise what, what would we have done? Yeah. I mean, I've been in the office less than five times since March yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and I've worked every day. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, um, well, and since, since we kind of brought up the pandemic, how do you think this year of online schooling now affects your early education and even, you know, that kindergarten, first, second grade, because those are critical years. And this has definitely not been a, a normal year for yeah. me at all. I mean, I would say that, um, you know, 
we don't know the answer until, you know, we'll know in a couple of years, right? When they're looking back. So we're, we're in the spot now of trying to forecast based on other things that have gone on, like what happened during the recession or, you know, or things like that, um, or using different models to try and predict what's going to happen. And, and I think that most of those models, you know, that I'm familiar with have suggested it's not so much a loss of, you know, like a learning loss, but a learning plateau. And, um, and it's like how, because, you know, most, most years you keep going up. That's the right. thing about education. Um, so it's going to, it's not like it goes down so much as it just levels off. And where is that going to be most extreme? Now, I think everybody agrees that it's going to be most extreme in among the kids who, you know, come from more disadvantaged backgrounds. And so what that means is that educational inequality is going to widen, as it often does during crises and things like this. Because, you know, kids from more privileged backgrounds, their families can marshal resources to, to try and protect them somewhat from that. You know, it could be, you've probably heard about people creating learning pods like rich families or, you know, not even rich, but like affluent families where they hire a teacher, you know, to come in and do that sort of stuff. Like that's a real thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and so that's important. Now then what about the early childhood education piece? You know, it is possible, like I feel pretty good about, um, you know, what's going on at UT right now. Like, you know, we're delivering a lot of our, edu most of our education online, but like, you know, we know what we're doing. And the students are, you know, adult-ish, right? And, you know, right. they're, they're more responsible. You know, they can engage and do that stuff. I feel the same way about high schools. This is certainly not true of everybody. Right. But, like, it is more, e it's a lot easier for a teenager to manage this, right? The real danger zone is with little kids where, I mean, the thought of a child sitting, I mean, a young, a six-year-old child sitting down for a day of learning, you know, on Zoom, I mean, it's just impossible to imagine. And, um, and so what that means is that the only way to make it work in any shape or form is to have parents like there, right? Like, and then you get into this problem again about what if your parents can't do that, as most cannot. Right. So I think that there is a, there's a forecasting that the big product of this is going to be more in, inequality and that that is likely to be more pronounced among younger children. I, you know, it's yeah. this critical learning phase, which is yeah. depressing. Um, but that's why, you know, you know, the vaccine's coming out and, you know, we can look around the bin. We still don't know how long this pause is going to be. But, um, you know, at least there's some light at the end of the tunnel. True. Yeah. I mean, I think about, so I have ADHD, but I'm old enough that that's not what it was. Yeah. yeah. Back then. <laughs> <There's> no <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, uh, my parents would not, did not believe in the medication mm -hmm. for, um, which in a lot of ways actually was, was probably the best thing for me, but you know, that that's not always how, how it works now. But I know for me, when like I was in third grade, I had a teacher who like pulled my desk into the corner and erected a barrier around me because I was so distracting yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to everyone else in class mm -hmm. because I literally could not sit still mm -hmm. for, you know, and even now as an adult, like we have training that comes out from the city and I'm like four hours on zoom. Nope, not, nope, yeah. can't, nope. Can't. Four yeah. hours on zoom and you're required to have your camera on the whole time. Mm -hmm. Nope, nope, can't do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, for me, it would just have been absolutely Mm -hmm. impossible there's no way that mm -hmm. I could have done it as a child if it existed because I mean yeah I um I mean you would have been forced into doing it and you wouldn't right. have gotten much from no. it that's the thing you know I mean no. so, and I'm you know the, these teachers are doing heroic things right like I mean they are 
keeping the ship afloat. I mean, that is the single most important thing, but they're working with a very difficult task. Right. Um, and, and it's a developmental task where, you know, children are just not developed, young children are just not developmentally capable of doing the same thing that a 16 year old is. Right. We poo poo 16 year olds all the time, you know, like teenagers, this and that, and their social media, but they are capable of, you know, unless there's some issues like with attention, they're capable of sitting down and taking classes and you know, right. doing the homework. And they just have something that little kids don't. Yeah. And, and I would think that like the transition for colleges was probably not that big of a deal. Mm-hmm. I mean, like I took my entire master's degree program online. Yeah. Uh, right. So it wasn't, yeah. So mm-hmm. it was, um, it was something that schools were uh, colleges and universities were already doing because almost every university in the country has at least one degree program that's mostly, if not completely online, but the learning curve to be a teacher and to try and figure all this out. And then, and because it's not the same lesson planning either. I mean, it's, it's a total shift. And then to have 30 little faces on a zoom, Mm -hmm. I, I can't imagine. And for Um, like nine hours a day. Yes. Colleges too. I mean, you know, most professors and most students are not in class for that many hours back to back. They're just not. Right. right? That's, that's, I mean, that's a very practical challenge right there. And just think about, you know, little kids who, you know, need to bounce around I mean it's just it's just really hard and then that's where their parents get sucked into it you know like I thank god I mean you know my kids are teenagers now and I had a lot of problems keeping them under control when this first started because you know they did not like being you know having their lives so constrained but the school part wasn't that hard to deal with. Um, and one of my kids is not a, you know, a super dedicated student by any means. I'm just saying that the difference between in-person and online high school wasn't a huge shift. And, and there's some things he actually likes about it. Um, but God, uh, you know, my neighbors have a five-year-old and I just, sometimes I would walk in front of their house and see what was going on in there. And I just think, oh my God, these parents deserve, you know, a gold medal (laughs) or something. I don't know. (laughs) So we have, we have uh, probably time for about one more because I know you need to, um, to scooch out. So since we've kind of, you've kind of talked to that, um, the other works that you've written are kind of, they've kind of been rolling together. Are you working on, do you have another project that you're already working on? Um, Anything you talk about? Yeah, so um, there's two big things. So I said, you know, I I sometimes focus on little kids and I sometimes focus on teenagers and young adults. And I tend to bounce back and forth between the two. Like once I've done one project, I shift to the other one, like just, just keeps me more interested that way. And um, so the big one that I'm doing right now with high schools, I'm involved with people here at UT and we created this intervention in schools and for high school students. And the intervention is really teaching them how to think about their own intelligence um, and to get kids past the idea that you're good at something or bad at something. Like I'm a math person or I'm not a math person or I, you know, like I'm just smart versus I'm dumb. And get them to think more about the fact that your skills are a continuum and that you grow them by working on them much the same way that you can build your biceps by lifting weights, right? And so the intervention is that it's called growth mindset intervention. And we did it in a, um, it was 15,000 high school students across the entire country, some here in Texas. Um, And we showed that this intervention actually um, raised grades and kept kids persisting like in harder classes, right? Like they wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't say, oh, I don't want to take that because it's hard. They'd be more likely to take it. Um, And, but also showed that So it worked in general, but it worked in some schools more than others, right? And one of the things that we found out was that um, 
doing this with students, if they develop this view, this mind, this mindset about their intelligence that was helpful, um, it didn't help them that much if they were in a classroom with a teacher who didn't think the same way. So like if I go into a math class and I have this the idea is like, there's no such thing as a math person or not a math person. It's really about like, you know, figuring out what you can do, how to do better, um, maybe not making straight A's, but doing better than you're doing right now. But you have a teacher who's like, nope, there's math people and not math people. And if you don't get it, you'll never get it, which many, you know, people are like, um, well, guess what? The way you think doesn't matter because your teacher doesn't think that way. So now we've shifted and we're using Texas as a test case with thousands of teachers here in the school to, to develop a similar intervention for teachers. So that, and then do an experiment, you know, where we randomly assign people to see whether it works with the goal that we could eventually package these two things together. Right? That's really That's cool. Fine. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. really cool. Yeah, I'm very, very proud of it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I am so glad that you joined us today. Um, it's been really a great conversation. And I want to thank everybody else who came. Um, if you would like to purchase a copy of the book, um, there are copies available at the Doc Bookshop in Fort Worth. Um, you can call uh, or order online. Um, the bookshop is open, is open, but it's open some limited hours. So um, it's better to call or do your order online to go pick up uh, and not just go. Um, and uh, we hope that you enjoy your holiday season and we invite you to join us for um, our New Year's Eve music special featuring our Amplify 817 artists. Um, it will be on New Year's Eve at about 9.30, and you can find more information um, on our website. It will be uh, a, uh, shown on our YouTube channel. So um, thanks, everybody, for coming, and have a great evening.